in. Uh, so it's, it's just a really cool moment for me to be here. And, uh, and so, yeah, I'm excited to uh, get into it. Thank you, Mark. Brothers and sisters, this is the way we have uh, designed it. I've prepared some questions for Mark. And, of course, uh, we'll post them to the author. But then, after every one or two questions, we'll pass the mic on to you. So, it could be about success, it could be about self-help, or any particular question uh, related to the grand scheme of achieving better in life. Please feel free to have it ready, and you have the opportunity to, to ask the author himself. Yeah? Does that work well for you? Can we do it that way? Yeah? One, uh, Mark, again, a pleasure. Uh, first time in the UAE? Uh, no, third, actually. Oh, really? But, but first time in Sharjah, right? First time in Sharjah. Uh, any first impressions that you would like to share? Uh, the hotel is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark hasn't stepped out much. I, I, I didn't get out much. I'm a little jet lagged. <laughs> the weather is just beginning to get better, so I hope and pray you'll get some time to enjoy Sharjah weather. I, I was told this is cold for here, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, we would wish... Uh, I think winter is a bit late this year, but then we, we hope and pray that it extends a little longer, yeah. You've tried the local cuisine? Oh, yes. Oh, really? Wonderful. Love it. Wonderful, yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this question might... The, the, the way it is framed might, might sound a bit odd, but I've just picked it from Mark's uh, uh, blog directly. Okay, so this is the way the question is posed. You write, it's a bit condescending, you write things that contradict a lot of the popular life advice and self-help out there. What's your problem, bro? <laughs> That's the way the question is, yeah? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I grew up reading a lot of typical self-help. It was a big part. My, my parents were into it. Uh, I started reading it as a teenager. And, and especially in the, in the United States, conventional self-help advice, you know, always think positive, always follow your dreams, uh, things, things like this, they, they're very much a part of the culture. And I think by the time I was in my mid or late 20s and, and writing myself, I, I was a little bit disillusioned with all, all of it. I, I felt like, um, you know, it, it, it was good advice to accomplish maybe a goal in the short term, but in terms of putting yourself on the right trajectory to live a meaningful life long term or to have meaningful commitments and relationships long term, uh, I found a lot of it to be counterproductive. And I actually found myself in, in, in a place where it was making me more unhappy. You know, it was chasing all these constant goals and dreams all the time. It was taking me away from the things that were right in front of me, the people that were right around me. Uh, and so I, I kind of had this deep philosophical investigation of a lot of my assumptions and a lot of the things that I had gotten from these books that I wrote. And the conclusion I came to is that if you have a poor definition of success, it doesn't matter how good your habits are, how early you wake up in the morning, how hard you work every day. If your definition is poor, then you're going to end up in a, in a bad place. Um, and so until, that defini until you get a good definition of what success is, what happiness is, what a good life is, uh, all, the, all the other stuff is, is either irrelevant or even counterproductive. And so I wanted to, with my work, I really wanted to restart the whole conversation of what self-help is and, and restart it from that starting point of, okay, let's get a definition of our, for ourselves of like what is important and what, what does matter. Then we can worry about all the life hacks and stuff like that. Oh, wonderful. I'm reminded of what Stephen Covey said where you could be climbing a ladder but then halfway through you realize that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. Exactly. So you could be making progress, you, you could be getting ahead, but ultimately the question is, is this what you really want? Yeah. Um, that would be quite a realization. I've been doing all this and ending up getting the, the wrong goal. Yeah, yeah and, and, and also I'll say too that once I got involved into the 
self-help and personal development industry, I started to notice a tendency that a lot of companies or influencers or gurus or whatever, they were, they weren't solving the problem. They were selling things that made people feel good, but they didn't actually address any issues, you know? Uh, and again, it kind of comes back to this, there, there wasn't this differentiation between feeling good and actually being good. You can be in a very good place in your life, but feel terrible. Uh, and you can also feel great, but also and have a completely meaningless, pointless existence. So uh, for me, like that, understanding that differentiation of like, oh, you know, just because I feel good doesn't mean I'm actually doing anything good with my life. Uh, that was a, a big aha moment. Uh, and, and one of the things that I'm very critical of the self-help industry about. I'm, I'm so happy you mentioned it, but I can see a lot of youngsters in the audience. Can you put your hands up for us, please? All the students in the audience? That's almost 20%, yeah? I, I wanted to ask you a question on your behalf, yeah? As a parent, too. I've got two kids. Uh, the new generation, Mark, uh, we often hear them saying, it's all about happiness, yeah? Do I really have to work hard at school? Do I really have to take a conventional job? Uh, at the end of the day, if I'm happy, I think that's the way it is. So, dear parents, don't push as hard. Focus on our happiness instead. So, something that you said, uh, which was, you could be happy, but you could be in a terrible place yes. uh, for the long term. Uh, but then you could be really struggling, but probably that's good for you. So, any particular advice to our young enthusiasts over there <laughs> uh, with respect to studying and setting goals and getting ahead? I, I think I think the best advice. I mean, I, when I think back to myself when I was in school, the the advice that I wish I got because it, when you're young, you tend to get two types of advice. One is what you just said, which is like, oh, just be happy, like follow your passion, do what you want, uh, and that can get you into a lot of trouble. And then there's this other advice, which is is like, just you have to get good grades and you have to study and you have to do perfect on your test and there's no explanation why. It's just like, this, this is what your existence is for. And I never liked that either. I'm like, hey, why, why do I need to do good in school? Uh, what I would say is, I, I think, to anyone young here, I would say, pick good challenges. Pick challenges that feel important or worthwhile to you. Um, and that can be within school, that can be uh, in a hobby, that can be um, you know, in your relationships with family members, but pick, find something in your life that is challenging, that, that causes you to struggle or sacrifice, but it feels worth that struggle or sacrifice. Uh, and ultimately, learn how to make that decision for yourself, because that is, in my opinion, one of the most important skills, is to decide what is important and worthwhile. Oh my God, I think, yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> he, he, he stated it in a very simple manner, but I, I think a lot of profound bits of wisdom there, yeah. First of all, you have to be convinced. You can't let the world decide uh, for you. Because when you get convinced, a lot of uh, faculties lying dormant within you wakes up. And then that's, that's what we call inspiration. And I think, guys, what, what the best-selling author, you know, is, is telling us is we have to get out of our comfort zones and seek challenges, worthy challenges, and your pursuit makes it worthy. And when you achieve it, that's when you really feel happy. So move out of the comfort zones, yeah? If exams are challenging, you need to pursue exams. If, if extracurricular activities are challenging, you need to do that. If working for the society is challenging, you need to do that. Uh, with that, would you have any questions for, for Mark? Anybody, if you could put your hand up, we can pass the mic on to you. Any questions for Mark? The gentleman uh, in the front row, can we please have the mic handed over to the gentleman? Uh, sister, oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hello. Um, my name is Ahmed Murad. I'm from Egypt. Uh, I'm a writer. Uh, I need to ask you about your success. Could your success be a comfort zone for you? A track for you now, after Absolutely. all the success? What's your plan after 
this success in uh, the whole world? That's a great question. And, and that's actually something I really struggled with after the success of, of Subtle Art. Because the easiest thing I could have done is basically rewrite Subtle Art all over again. <laughs> it would have taken a couple months, I would have made a bunch of money, uh, and it, it would have been the safe option. But, like you said, it's a bit of a trap. You know, when, once you kind of let yourself just get comfortable saying the same thing over and over again, uh, not only does it, it rob the experience of, of the, the meaning and importance of what I'm doing, but it also, you start to get, I guess, entitled of like, all right, this is how much money I should be making and I'm just gonna keep repeating the same thing over and over. So with, with my, my second book, I really consciously challenged myself to not repeat myself, to, to really push into topics and ideas that were new, that were uncomfortable, um, that I wasn't completely sure about. And I, and I understood that I was, a lot of the people who loved the first book wouldn't love the second book. And, but I, I, speaking of worth, worthy struggles or worthy challenges, I decided that that was worth it. That maybe alienating a, a certain percent of my audience, uh, for me to still be proud of my career and my craft and still push myself to keep learning and keep experimenting, um, to me that was worth it. And so it was agonizing and, <laughs> and it was, you know, the, the month that the book came out, I think I was under my desk, like in a fetal position half the time. Um, but, you know, ultimately I'm proud of it. And, I, and that, that ability to be proud of it is worth more than, you know, however much extra money I would have gotten or extra book sales I would have gotten. Thank you. Do I see another hand go up? There's somebody at the back, the lady at the back. Could you kindly hand the mic over to her? Hi, uh, so my name is Afreen and I work for Procter & Gamble. And uh, we have this mentorship program there where you uh, select a mentor who sort of guides you on your career and life in general. And uh, it was a coincidence that on Thursday I was in a mentoring session and my mentor advised me to read your book on a subtle art on here and, uh, and I told him, guess what, I'm, I'm going to attend this talk this, uh, this Saturday. So uh, I haven't started reading the book yet, but uh, what would you advise in terms of, uh, you know, a challenge, I mean, how to get through the challenges at work? Challenges at work. How would you think you're going through the, uh, the, the challenges at work? Well, without spoiling the book too much, because I, I want you to read it. <laughs> I, I think a lot of what people, I think most challenges that people experience at, at work, they, they fall into one of two categories. One is that, is kind of what I was talking about earlier, is that the work doesn't feel very meaningful or worthwhile. Uh, you know, they're, they're stuck in a job that they don't, they don't see the contribution that they're making to the world or they don't uh, feel very connected to the mission of the company. Um, and so it just feels like a paycheck. And usually, whenever you're doing something for a paycheck, you can keep yourself motivated for a while, but at some point, after a certain amount of months or years, uh, you're gonna burn out and there's, you know, you're, you're gonna start running into a lot of problems. So that's kind of one category of problem that you see a lot. I think the other category is more work culture and environment. Uh, there are some companies that are very good about work culture. I actually, I had a friend who worked at Procter & Gamble, so I know that they're actually very good about corporate culture. Um, there's some companies that have terrible cor corporate culture. It's very demeaning and uh, disrespectful, a lot of corruption and lying politics that happen. Uh, and so in those situations, it's, uh, it's, it's much more difficult 
to kind of figure out, is it worth staying? Is it worth dealing with these certain people or these certain practices? Uh, and and that that's more of a case by case basis thing. But in terms of that first category, the like, is my work meaningful? Is this worth, you know, am I just doing this for a paycheck or is there something more that I could be doing with my life? Uh, that, the book will absolutely address that. So enjoy your weekend. <laughs> Shirin from Egypt. Uh, I used to read uh, your articles before you published your first book. Oh, cool. Uh, then I, uh, I told him it would be a bestseller. He's my husband, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I won. Um, Wife's always right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, your book changed my life and your articles a lot. So, what's the book that changed your life, and who's your favorite author? Oh, man. She's stealing my question. She's stealing your question. <laughs> I'm an anchor, too. <laughs> you know, it, it's the... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the favorite author first, because that's easier. Um, I love... I love David Foster Wallace is the author that made me want to be an author. Uh, I never really considered it seriously until I discovered his nonfiction. And then I, I, Tolstoy's work is also like just every time I read Tolstoy, I'm like, I can't believe a human actually produced this. Like this is, it's so brilliant that I'm still not sure an alien didn't come down and like give it to us. Uh, but in terms of like books that affected my life, you know, this is always a funny question because a lot of the books that affected my life very deeply, I don't even know if they're necessarily good books. <laughs> like I don't know if I'd recommend them to everybody. Um, and there, there are things that like I don't even agree with. But like, for instance, I read when I was speaking of being a student. When I was 18, I read Atlas Shrugged by Anne Rand. And when I was 18, I was a very I was a poor student. I was very lazy, and um, I just played guitar and smoked marijuana. And um, <laughs> in case any of the students here are, are worried, um, and but it, it was a problem because I was essentially I was avoiding life. And I had a period that I went through. I wrote about my friend who died. And it was, it was a, had a pretty profound experience for me. But I, around that time too, I read Anne Rand's Atlas Shrugged, and. From a political standpoint, I think it's absolutely, it's a ridiculous book, but there was, she has these like monologues in the book, these like 20 page monologues where the characters talk about how the, to not utilize your talent is like an ethical flaw. Like you are harming the world by not contributing to the planet. That you are actively hurting yourself and others if you are not, uh, being as productive as you can possibly be. And like that was such a wake-up call. I never thought about it in those terms. Um, and so that was a really powerful book for me. But, you know, would I recommend it? I don't, you know, I, I don't even like that book anymore. But it, it really did change my life. Another, another book that's very similar to that was Tim Ferriss's 4-Hour Workweek. And um, I think at the time when I read it in 2008, it was mind-blowing. Gave me the courage to quit my job and start a website, uh, but if you look at it now, it's like half the advice is outdated. So, so yeah, I always feel funny answering that question. <laughs> but thank you. There's another lovely book that I came across. It says "Die Empty." It says uh, all your strengths and your talents don't take it to the graveyard. Yeah? yeah. Make sure that you use it in a productive way and add value to the there, world. There's a there's a Bukowski quote, and I quote Bukowski a lot in my work, but there's a Bukowski quote that I love where he says, um, live so well that death will be afraid to take you. Profound, yeah? Yeah. Death comes and says, can I take you? A lot of things yet to be completed, you're adding so much value. Yeah? Yeah. Great. Uh, this is a question that I wanted to ask. This is not from uh, his books. Now, I, I really want to know how he answers because I've had the opportunity to be associated with the book fair for quite a while and I've spoken to others and Mark is so down to earth, so humble that you know he gives you the courage to be genuine 
Yeah, uh, I, I, I met him in the first few minutes. I took that mask off that I was wearing about my credentials and what I do because he was so genuine, so genuine. So let me ask him this question. What would you consider as your greatest achievement till date? And what would you consider as your greatest strength? Well, greatest strength, I think, I think I synthesize information very well. Um, it's funny because sometimes I get, I get criticized. People will say like, well, you didn't really come up with any of these ideas. I'm like, of course not. Like, <laughs> nobody came, it's been 2,000 years since anybody, came, yeah, since anybody came up with these ideas. We're all just repackaging the same, you know, these same ideas have been in philosophy and religion for thousands of years, you know. So, but I, I think my talent is, is that I, I read very widely. I read a lot of different subjects and I find commonalities and I tie them together and I think I have a talent for tying them together in a way that is very easy for other people to understand. Um, so I think that's just my particular you know, superpower. In terms of uh, what is my greatest achievement, I mean, from the outside, I think obviously it has to be the success of Subtle Art. I, I don't think there's really anything you can compare to that. In terms of like what I'm personally proudest of, I'm actually, I think I'm actually proudest of building my website. I think that's actually the hardest thing I ever did. And getting, I was sleeping on a friend's couch, um, I had $50 in my bank account, and I was working 16 hours a day for almost a year before I, I was making enough money to actually feed myself <laughs> regularly. You know, and so when I came out of that and I actually was able to live off of uh, my writing online, like that, I think that was, for me personally, that's what I'm most proud of. Wonderful. Did you ever imagine that subtle art would be so successful, even in your dreams? No. <laughs> what I what I tell people is like anybody who expects that, like you're just a horrible person. <laughs> like, it's it's like the Avengers of publishing. You know, like you can't you can't play. But then with that kind of readership for your blog, I think it was a natural progression, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I think I think we all expected it to do well. I think we expected it to be a bestseller. I think we expected to sell a lot of copies, but like. A lot of copies for most books is like a hundred thousand copies. You're you're doing amazing, you know. And uh, uh, last I heard, we were at nine million. So, <laughs> guys, do you know how many zeros are there? Nine million. <laughs> nine million, mashallah. Yeah. So, did did the success scare you? Like the next time you wrote a book, I think it's related to the question the gentleman asked. Nine million copies. So when you came out with another book, where you like. So much of high expectations. Terrifying. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying. <laughs> because it's when you know when when you overshoot the mark so much. What I realized with the second book is like I don't actually know what a just a normal successful book looks like. Uh, because anything when you when when something is like that far into the stratosphere, everything looks like a failure. So the second book did really well. It's already sold I think almost half a million copies. Uh, but it feels like a failure, and that's just that's just the price of you know that that sort of success of having raised the threshold so high, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's literally unreachable. But I hope it does. I hope it does. Brothers and sisters, very his book has got a a quote which is very spiritual, and as someone who loves to read spiritual poems, I, I found it very very appealing. It says, "Love people." without expecting anything in return. Love people without expecting anything in return. Now, many of us have loved, many of us have given, many of us have felt hurt. And I think we've always wanted the world to reciprocate, right? I've done this, I've done so much, why doesn't you reciprocate? So my question is, is it humanly possible to love and give without expecting anything in return? <laughs> is it possible? I think so. Uh, is it easy? No. And and I don't know if it's. I don't know if if acting unconditionally is ever anything that you you 
any of us master. I think it's, it's something that we all work towards uh, and practice at and get better at, but you're never done. You know, there's always that selfish ego part of you that's like, wait a second, no, I deserve this, give me, give me, give me. And uh, you're never gonna silence that completely. Uh, before your popularity uh, went up the charts, I'm sure there was a stage where you were giving and giving through your blogs, probably speaking, and not getting enough returns, right? Uh, I'm sure a lot of us face this problem, mm -hmm. you know, they call you to, to speak, they, you write. You have a target, yes, uh, I, I, I'm publishing, I, I have to sell so many books. But that particular phase where you're giving and giving without getting in return, how do you reconcile that? Mm -hmm. Do you just tell yourself that things will work out in the end? or You know, I, I, one thing, I, I wrote an article recently about this, but I, I actually think, I try to let go of the idea of, of deserving at all. I don't know what I deserve. And, and yeah, early in my career, I, I gave and I gave and I gave, I gave and I felt, yes, I did feel like I wasn't getting as much back as maybe I deserved. Um, recently, the last couple of years, I feel like I'm getting way more back than I deserve. You know, sometimes I look around, I'm like, you know, I don't need all this. Like, this is, thanks, but <laughs> the book wasn't that good. But it, it's, you know, the world's not fair. And... And our, our, our perceptions are also very limited in terms of the scope of time that we are capable of thinking about. You know, maybe, maybe something that feels very unfair today ends up three years from now being really good for you. You know, maybe, maybe you, it teaches you a lesson that was really important and you needed, you needed to feel that it was unfair for you to get to that new place. Uh, you just, you never know. And so, Whenever I find myself feeling like that, I just try to let it, just drop it. It's like, I don't know what I deserve. You know, it's like, we all, we all get cheated a little bit in life, and we all get rewarded a little bit in life, and I, I just try not to think about it too much. SubhanAllah, I, I hope we have, this is sinking in. I think what Mark is saying is, let's say we're in, we in a relationship, and we're giving, yeah, I'll come to you, sister. We're, we're, we're giving and we're not getting anything in return. We have to let go of that need to get something in return immediately. So by asking a question, you know, I don't know what I deserve. And probably wait with sabr. And I think at some time in the future, uh, our fortunes change and the thresholds change. And then when you get it back, I love the way he said it, the book is not that good. Oh my God, it is good. It's sold 9 million copies. But then at some time the tips turn in our favor and it all comes back. So we just have to give and have supper. So I, I think the lady is getting quite angry at me. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. I've been told that you have to choose me in order to ask the question. That's why I'm like, you know, here. It's, here. it's, it's a pleasure, sister. Please. Thanks. So, um, Mark, uh, thanks for being here. It's my pleasure to attend your um, uh, panel. I've read your book. I've read it so many times. Uh, it helped me a lot. I have two questions. First of all, um, we live in the Middle East where uh, culture is a very strong component of how we, um, how we perform. So we're get, we get evaluated and judged based on standards that we were born on in terms of how successful you are, in your job, how much money you have, are you married, do you have kids, and all these standards that if you don't live by them, then you're a failure. Um, for someone like me, I was born here. Uh, my name is Rasha, by the way, I'm Palestinian. I was born in Dubai, I lived all my life in here. I traveled the world. And the challenge that I have here is, how can I uh, be happy even though the whole world is looking at me by maybe saying she's in a terrible place because you know, I'm not in that place where I'm so successful yet. I could be, but I don't want to. So, what is your advice for someone, for the Middle East people who has to abide by certain rules, otherwise, you know, like, you're someone who's, you don't belong, which gives me the thought of maybe I need to migrate to another part of the world. That's my first question. 
The second question is, when I see your interviews where you said meditation helps you to be, um, you know, to have a clarity of mind, at the same time your book says that you're against these things that makes people feel good about themselves. It's a bit confusing for me because huge part of the meditation says, I'm beautiful, I'm smart, you know, like, it makes you feel good about yourself and it helped me somehow to feel good about myself. But at the same time, I don't want to be in that fake place of thinking that I'm, I'm beautiful, but the reality is I'm not, as an example. Mm -hmm. So these are my two questions. I have a lot, by the way, but I'm not sure if asking, <laughs> if asking more questions in front of young audience is right, to be honest with you, because the book is so deep that we have so many questions that I don't think having young adults is the right thing. So that's my comments to organizers. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I'll do my best with this. I, I think the second one's a little bit easier. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I get asked about affirmations a lot, you know. Affirmations are, is the classic self-help practice of telling yourself, I am smart, I am beautiful, I am loved. Um, and, it, and it does make you feel better in the short term. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with affirmations. I think. You just need to be realistic about what you're doing, which is you're, you know, you're, you're, it's a short-term solution. It's not gonna solve any sort of underlying insecurity. You can stand in the mirror and tell yourself that you're smart for years, and, and it's, unless you actually like address what, what the identity level issue is, it's, you, you're, you're just keep putting a new Band-Aid on the same cut over and over and over again. Um, the first question, that's hard. I can, I can answer it in a broader philosophical way, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer it satisfactorily for you. Uh, one, because I'm a man who lives in the United States, uh, and so I don't I mean, we all face cultural judgment and cultural pressures, but I don't experience it nearly to the extent that, say, you would experience it or a lot of people in the Middle East would experience it. Um, so I just, I put that preamble out there because I think what I, what I am gonna say, I, I do believe it's true, but uh, it's also easy for me to say. So, because I don't know ex exactly what you go through or the, the, the extremity of what you go through. Um, in terms of cultural pressures, I mean, it's hard. You know, I, I think it's in a perfect, I, I think there's a little bit of an illusion in the world today. Like people just want to, I, in fact, I think one reason my book has sold 9 million copies is because like most of the people who bought it are like, yeah, I don't want to care what my culture thinks anymore. I want to just be able to do what I want and be the person I want to be and not feel bad or feel guilty or be judged for. And I get that desire. Like, I have that desire. I think everybody has that desire on some level. Um, the problem is, is that we are a social and cultural species. Like, we need... <laughs> We have to exist within a society, and those societies have rules and norms that have evolved and existed for a reason, and it's, even if a lot of people are not satisfied with those rules and norms, it's, you know, you just kind of, it sucks, you know, you have to deal with it. And so that, it basically leaves you with two options. One is that you just decide that suffering through it is worth it, which not, doesn't sound very exciting. Uh, and two is that you can decide to try to influence it in some way, to try to turn, make it meaningful. And that tends to be my advice in these situations, um, is that if, if there is something like that, that that is making you feel judged and persecuted, and, and you feel like there's no kind of alternative or way to get out of it, um, then the best thing you can do is, is turn it into a meaningful struggle by being an influence and creating new norms uh, so that other people in the future, future generations don't experience the same pain that you do. Uh, again, easy for me to say, and obviously that 
process or the, the, how realistic that is is going to vary from culture to culture and country to country. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I'm realistic about that. But in terms of an answer, I think that's, that's the best I can do, you know? It's hard. And I, I sympathize with you. Um, and I wish I could say something that would be like, ah, that's it. I'll go do that, you know? But it's, the world's a rough place. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been reading a lot about the, about affirmations and the research behind it. And, and uh, sister, if I could add any value, I think what it says is if, let's say I'm conscious about my looks, okay? And then I stand in front of the mirror and I say, I look like George Clooney, Rahim, you look like George Clooney. You look like, I don't think it's going to work, yeah? Because <laughs> deep down, I know uh, I look better than Josh Clooney. Anyway, so yeah. <laughs> the question is, I can still focus on my strengths. Ibrahim, you're a, you're a warm and friendly person. Ibrahim, you're a good learner. So let's say you've got some bits and pieces hating you for your, for your weaknesses. Instead of coming up with affirmations against them, you can constantly remind yourself of your strengths. And that sort of counterbalances the equation. So that's a good strategy. Uh, any aspiring, any published authors in the audience? Oh, wonderful. Uh, anyone from the youngsters? Um, you're young too. Anyway, uh, <laughs> any aspiring authors? Somebody whose the book is already in the mind and then... You're one? Okay. Would you have any questions to an author who has sold 9 million copies? Yeah, please. My name is Ronald, uh, I'm from India. Uh, I'm actually a young writer and a poet. So uh, my question is, uh, I wanted a writing advice from you. Like authors usually have this first draft, then they edit, they have the second draft. Authors have a couple of drafts, right? When did you decide uh, the subtle art, this is the final draft? Like, what <laughs> stopped you from going for another draft of editing? You know, this is it, it's good, I'll publish it. When did you? reach that point? That's, That's a great question. question. Um, I think when my publisher called and <laughs> said, give it to us. <laughs> uh, I mean, is it, no, this is, this is a good question because it's, you can just keep going over something forever. And, and at a certain point, it stops being productive. It actually becomes counterproductive because you start overthinking things and overanalyzing things. Um, I, I found that it's, so there's certain, like typically, like say the first or se like the first revision or the second revision, you, it's very obvious that you're making the text better. Uh, you're simplifying it, you're cutting things, you're going through, you're making it, you're making the language sing a little bit more. Um, at a certain point, it gets it, it. It feels like you're polishing a rock, and at a certain point, it feels like it, it's kind of becoming impossible to polish it anymore. And so you start inventing little things for you to change or rewrite or add. Uh, and you start creating more work for yourself. You know, the point of revision is to make less work for yourself. And so I think just at some point over the years, I I learned in myself to recognize when I was switching from making less work for myself into making more work for myself, and that's when I kind of learned to stop it. Um, the, the one thing I'll just comment about writing in general, and I think this, this, this applies to any art, uh, whether you're doing music or graphic design or whatever, but it, it certainly applies to writing. A lot of the artistic process or the creative process is it's a very personal, like you have to learn to understand yourself. Like I have certain uh, traps that I fall into in my, in my writing process. And I had to learn through experience where those traps were and how to prevent myself from falling into them. You know, so different writers, they learn, okay, you know, some writers, they just set like, I do five drafts and that's it. And like, that's the rule. Other writers, they, they go by feel. You know, some writers, it's like, I, I write 2,000 words a day. Uh, I, the word counts didn't really work well for me. I, I preferred 
to go by, I write for three hours a day. And you know, whether I write 200 words or 2,000, it doesn't matter, I just show up and I write for three hours. So um, there's a self-discovery process that happens when you're creating art and you have to kind of learn and understand your own ticks and quirks and nuances and things like that. Uh, SubhanAllah, when you published the book, in the acknowledgments, you can say, editing advice from Mark Manson. <laughs> <laughs> One question before there's a lady who has put her hand up. Mark, you said you write for three hours, right? At a stretch. Yeah. How do you manage to keep distractions at bay? How do you keep this away? Yeah? Oh, yeah? That's a good question. It's, I, I basically lock myself in a room. So my, the compu I have a computer that I write on and the only purpose of this computer is to write stuff on it. Uh, and everything is blocked on that machine. So I have software that blocks Facebook and Twitter and everything, it blocks all the news sites, it blocks all the apps. Uh, I leave the phone in the other room uh, I close the door, my wife knows not to bother me, and it's, it's just, it's, uh, it's like putting yourself in a prison, basically, because it's, it's the only way that it actually happens. Yeah, and you do that, and you complete three hours of meaningful writing, do you reward yourself with anything? Um, well, yeah, well, because, yeah, I mean, then I go sit on the couch and play video games all day, you know, but then at least I don't feel guilty because I do that anyway, but at least if I've written for three hours, I don't feel guilty while I'm doing it. <laughs> Youngsters, I think, I think that's an equation you need to catch from Mark. <laughs> Life is purpose plus pleasure, yeah? So, so do your purpose bit first, finish your targets, and then you can play video games all day. <laughs> Any particular game you'd like to recommend, Mark? Oh, <laughs> we, we don't have enough time for that. <laughs> I'll have time for probably maybe a, a question, just one more question, but there was somebody out there, sister, there was this lady who, uh, somebody from the back could put her hand up, yeah. I'm so sorry that this is such a transition from what we're doing. Um, if you never became a writer, what was your backup plan? What would you be doing right now if you never became a writer? What would I be doing? I have no idea, but... I went to school, I studied international business and finance. Uh, I worked for two months in a bank and I hated every second of it. So I would never go back to that. Um, originally when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a musician. And I actually, I went to music school for a year. Um, so that music is still my first love. It's still my creative home, I think. But yeah, I have no idea what I'd be. Also, uh, would you ever like your book to be turned into a movie? Or would you ever write a story that would, you would want to turn it into a movie? Um, I'm open to it. And people, people have approached me, film and TV people have been approaching me about projects. And I'm working with Will Smith right now, and he's obviously has connections to movies. That's awesome. <laughs> so maybe, we'll see. Do it. Do it. <laughs> my, my teenage son picks the book from Borders, yeah, and I, I looked at the title, I, I went to the back car and I said, this is probably something that you would love as a teenager, yeah. He read the book and he came back to me and said, Baba, this is something that you would love, you know, because at the end of the day, he's really telling us to work hard, embrace pain and, you know, uh, and a lot of profound stuff up there. I, I, I know, guys, but there's one question that I really want to ask. I think that's the root of the word motivation, yeah? Mark in his book says, why don't we do the things we know we should do? Like, I know I should be exercising every day, but I don't do that. I know we should be probably staying away from our phones a lot more, but we don't do that. I know, we know that we should take care of our relationships, but sometimes we don't do that. So, we agree, we, we don't do what we're supposed to do, but what's your advice, Mark? How do we come around that problem here? It's, so I'll give, I'll give the short answer. The long answer is chapter two of the new book. Everything is F, the book about hope. Uh, the, 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 the whole problem, the reason that we get into these issues is that our decision-making is, is based on our emotions. 
Like the way I describe it is that we, we have, it's like we have two brains in our head, a, a feeling brain, an emotional brain, and a thinking brain. And uh, we like to, as the thinking brain, we like to think that we're in control and that we're the ones making the decisions, but uh, it's actually the emotional brain that is making the decisions. So you, you can read 20 books about exercise and understand different workout programs and all the health benefits, but until you feel like exercising, you're not getting off the couch. And that's just the really tragic truth <laughs> about all of us all the time. And so what I, what I write about is I say that if really, if that's the case, then self-discipline is, it's not, a, it's not a problem of information, it's not a problem of knowledge, it's a problem of emotion. You know, procrastination is an emotional problem. Self-discipline is an emotional problem. Motivation is an emotional problem. And so we have to attack these problems as emotional problems. We have to dig into ourselves and understand, okay, what, what is it that is intimidating about a gym or that is demoralizing about waking up early or whatever and, and start asking ourselves um, if we could change how we feel about it. There's some intense <laughs> hand waving oh, yes. going on. Just if you could, yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Hi, my name is Bushra. Uh, so you have written so many books. I just want to ask you that, what inspired you to write the book Subtle Arts? <laughs> I, I really wanted to my, my initial inspiration was I felt it was very important to write a self-help book about pain <laughs> because every book, when I, when I looked around the industry, every book was about feeling good all the time. Do this and you'll feel great. Do this and you can be happy. And I was like, that's, that's nonsense. Like, life sucks. So like, let's write a book about that. And, um, and so that was my goal. Is it, I thought of it when I was writing it. I thought of it as like a like kind of a negative self help or an anti self help. And um, and so my goal was to go like as he pointed out. I wanted to go against all the conventional advice, but I, I also still wanted to give really useful advice. Um, and and just the fact that it caught on so well is amazing. I never expected it. So thank, thank you. you. Good morning, Mr. Madison. Hello. Uh, my name is Isra, and I would like to ask you as a student, how was your school and what were you good at? You know what's funny? I actually, I got bad grades in writing class. Oh. <laughs> so much for our <laughs> testing standards. Yeah. <laughs> I actually thought about when, when the book became really successful, I actually thought about sending a copy to my to my writing teacher uh, with a really snarky comment in the front or something, and I was like, no, that's petty. Um, you know what's funny? I was good at, I was good at math. Um, <laughs> Whoa. Uh, no, seriously, I was good at math. And, and my, I come from, my whole father's side of the family is our engineers, and, um, and so just numbers, I can do number. I can do calculations in my head pretty easily, and um, so I always did well in, in math, but when, when I look back, the, the issue with writing and language, it wasn't, it wasn't that I was bad at it, I think I'm actually much, I'm a much better writer than I am, you know, with math or science. The problem was is that I just, I never did homework, and, and so when I came to school, I could figure out the math problems, because there's only one correct answer. But if you didn't do the homework or you didn't read the book, you can't fake an essay. Like you can't fake a writing assignment. Um, and so my teachers realized that and they gave me bad grades. So I'm a terrible person to ask these questions, by the way. Um, <laughs> clearly I'm not a role model when it comes to academics. <laughs> All is well that ends well, mashallah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just imagine the teacher getting an envelope saying, here are the reviews for my book and here's the progress card that you gave me. <laughs> and see how different they are. I, so. I mean, I, I will say this about school. Um, 
school is important up to a certain point and and i because i get asked about school a lot and and whether i think it's important and um and i get asked about my history with it and i always feel weird answering but it, it's i think the most important thing about school is is to just not fail <laughs> you know that i think if you if there was a curve of how much benefit comes from the amount of studying like the curve levels out towards the top like I, it's for most things in the world just the fact that you went and you finished it is far more important than if you like got straight a's or was number one in your class because it's honestly by the time you're 25 nobody remembers or cares Sorry, parents. Um, I apologize. No, well, we, we, we do. We, uh, guys, don't get this wrong. What Mark says is as long as you develop those traits within you, yeah, which compels you to lock yourself in a room for three hours, even after selling nine million books, switching off all the, uh, all the tabs on your, on your PC and keeping the phone away, those kind of traits, uh, well, then I think tra then grades don't matter. So, so get that right, yeah. <laughs> I, and, and I will say this, one of the best things a teacher ever told me is the teacher said, because I, I said the thing a lot of kids said, I'm like, well, why, I don't need to learn about chemistry, when am I gonna use this? And my teacher said, it's not about the chemistry, it's learning how to learn. And school teaches you how to learn, and so the most important thing you can get out of school is simply to learn how to learn. Learn how to work, learn how to remember things, learn how to use things that you learned. That's what matters. The actual number next to your name is less important. Thank you. I, I think we have a lady in the front row with a question. Hi, good morning. Hello. Um, I just wanted to welcome you here in Sharjah. And I wanted to ask a question about the third chapter in your first book. So I read your book, but it was in Arabic, so I translated it. So I'm not sure about the um, title itself. But you said, that a person, don't think about yourself as an exceptional, special person. And I think that's the only chapter where I couldn't signify anything to myself. It was very challenging to read, and mm. I couldn't even underline anything. Um, when did you reach that point of view while growing up, knowing that you're not, or not to expect being an exceptional person in this world, since we are a billion or nine billion people all around the world itself? It gets really challenging. I, for me, I just, I look back at all of the mean and stupid things I've done in my life, and most of them were motivated by this sense that I, I was special and I deserved it. And at some point I started to realize that in myself. Um, and also in my career, when I started experiencing success, I noticed that the more I, I kind of like, oh my God, my website got 100,000 visitors, like I'm killing it, I'm, I'm like, I'm the best. The more I realized that I let myself kind of buy into that narrative, um, the worse it made me feel, the more pressure it put on me, uh, the less empathetic I was towards others, the meaner I was towards others. Um, you know, it was just, it was feeding my ego monster. And, um, and around the same time, I, I was on this biography kick. I was reading a lot of, like I read Steve Jobs' biography, and I read Churchill's biography, and I, Abraham Lincoln's biography, and a bunch of these other people. And I was really struck by how um, they all seemed to, like one of the character traits that all these really great historical figures had was that they always had this sense that it wasn't, what they were doing wasn't spectacular. They're like, this isn't spec, this is just, it needs to be done. I'm, I'm doing this because it, it's obvious and it needs to be done and I'm not special, I just have to be the person here to do it. Um, and so it just, it just struck me, you know? And it's, when you look at, when you get into the psychological research around it too, it's uh, narcissistic traits correlate very strongly with antisocial behavior, with crime, with all sorts of things. And so, and I mean, honestly, when you get down to it, 99% of what we do is boring, mundane stuff. You know, it's like, I, I get asked when I do talks like this, people are like, oh, well, you sold 9 million books. Like, you're special. Like, and I'm like, actually, no, because 
I mean, in this moment, yeah, I'm the guy with the microphone. So, okay, I'm special for now. Uh, but in like an hour, I'm gonna go back to my hotel room and I'm gonna like take a shower and I'm gonna do all the same boring stuff you people do. And it's like, there's absolutely nothing special about it. So, um, I try to keep that in mind. Uh, the clock is against us, unfortunately. <laughs> Brown sisters, uh, Mark has got another session in the evening where probably he'll have a presentation for you as well. So please bring your friends in. Um, I think they shouldn't lose this amazing opportunity to interact, not just with an amazing author, but with an amazing person as well. For me, what I learned in the last uh, 90 minutes or so is you can be successful and yet be so cool, yeah? Oh, <laughs> that, that was an amazing, that was an amazing experience. Guys, you need to put your hands together for yourselves. Please put your hands together for the audience. Thank you. Uh, I think a lot of meaningful questions. Do you have anything to say uh, to them? Uh, uh, I will be speaking this evening at 7.15, I think here. This Probably the same This meeting. stage. Yes. Uh, so I'll be here tonight. Um, I'll be doing, I'll be signing books tonight, I'll be meeting people, um, and I'll probably be around a little bit after today too. I don't know if I'm signing books this morning, but, uh, oh, somebody's saying, I don't know. Anyway, I'm around, so come out tonight, um, happy to meet you, sign books, take pictures, uh, and thanks for coming out. Uh, there's a book signing session, probably, that's going to happen outside the, the hall. There so, you go. Yeah, so you have an opportunity to, to, to take things offline with the author and get an autograph book as well. Uh, dear Mark, in this part of the world, when there's someone that we love and he's, he's doing things, meaningful things consistently, we look at him and say, Taufik, which means you are successful, be more successful. So on behalf of our beloved book fair, uh, on, on behalf of a culture here that loves and respects art, and literature, and values. We thank you for being with us, and uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. With Taufik. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.